chapter 68. Almost at once before the group even got out of Texas, Jake had cause to regret that he'd ever agreed to ride with the Suggs brothers. First night he camped with them, not 30 miles north of Dallas, he heard talk that frightened him. The boys were discussing two outlaws who were in jail in Fort Worth waiting to hang, and Dan Suggs claimed it was July Johnson who'd brought them both in. The robbers had put out the story that July was traveling with a young girl who could throw rocks better than most men could shoot. <laughs> I'd like to see her throw rocks better than Frog can shoot, Roy Suggs said. I guess Frog could cool her off. Frog Lip didn't say much. He was a black man, but Jake didn't notice anyone giving him many orders. Little Eddie Suggs cooked the supper, such as it was, while Frog Lip sat idle, not even chopping wood for the fire. The horse he rode was the best in the group, a white gelding. It was unusual to see a bandit who used a white horse, for it made him stand out in the group. Frog Lip evidently didn't care. We ought to get them boys out of jail, Roy Suggs said. They might make good regulators. If a girl and one sheriff can take them, I wouldn't want them, Dan Suggs said. Besides, I had some trouble with Jim once myself. I'd go watch him hang if I had time, damn him. Their talk, it seemed, was mostly of killing. Even little Eddie, the youngest, claimed to have killed three men, two nesters, and a Mexican. The rest of the outfit didn't mention numbers, but Jake had no doubt that he was riding with accomplished killers. Dan Suggs seemed to hate everybody he knew. He spoke in the vilest language of everyone, but his particular hatred was cowboys. He had trailed a herd once and not done well with it, and it left him resentful of those with better luck. I'd like to steal a whole goddamn herd and sell it, Dan said. There ain't but five of us, Eddie pointed out. It takes more than five to drive cattle. Dan Suggs had a mean glint in his eye. He had made the remark idly, but once he thought about it, it seemed to make a great deal of sense. We could hire a little more help, he said. I remember that one time we tried to drive cattle, Roy said. The Indians run half of them, and we nearly all drowned them rivers. Why well, try it again? You ain't heard the plan, so shut up. Dan said with a touch of anger. What we done wrong the first time was doing it honest. I'm through with honest. It's every man for himself in this country, and that's the way I like it. There ain't much law, and mostly it can be outrun. Who's heard you would you steal? Jake asked. Oh, closest one to dodge, Dan said. Find some herds that's just about there and steal it. Maybe a day or two shy of the towns. Then we just drive it in and sell it and be gone. We'll get all the money and none of the work. What about the boys who drove it all that way, Jake said. They might not want to give up their profits that easy. We'd plan them, Dan said. Shoot them and sell their cattle and be long gone before anyone ever missed them. What if one run and didn't get planted, Roy said. It don't take but one to tell the story and then we'd have a posse to fight. Frog's got a fast horse, Dan said. He could run down any man who escaped. I'd rather rob banks myself, little Eddie said. Then you've got the money right in your hands. You don't have to sell no cows. Well, you're lazy, Ed, Dan said, looking at his brother as if he were mad enough to shoot him. In fact, the Suggs brothers seemed to live on the edge of fratricidal warfare. What do you boys know about this blue duck? Jake asked, mainly to change the subject. We know to let him be, Dan said. Frog don't care for him. Why not? Stole my horse, Frog Lip said. He didn't elaborate. They were passing a whiskey bottle around, and he took his turn as if he were a white man. Whiskey had no effect on any of them, except little Eddie who turned red eye and wobbly after five or six turns. Jake drank liberally, for he felt uncomfortable. He had not meant to slip into such rough company, and was worried, for now he had slipped in, he could see that it wasn't going to be any too easy to slip back out. After all, he had heard them discuss killing a whole crew of cowboys, calculating the killings as casually as they might pick ticks off a dog. He'd been in much questionable company in his life, but the Suggs brothers weren't questionable. They were just hard. Moreover, the silent black man, Frog, had a very fast horse. Escaping them would need some care. He knew they didn't trust him. Their eyes were cold when they looked his way. He resolved to be very careful and make no move that might antagonize them until the situation was in his favor, which it wouldn't be until they got into Kansas towns. With a crowd around, he might slip away. Besides that, killing could always work two ways. Gus was fond of saying that even the meanest bad man could always run into someone meaner and quicker. 
Dan Suggs could easily meet a violent end, in which case the others might not care who stayed or went. The next day they rode into Doan's store on the banks of the Red River and stopped to buy whiskey and considered their route. A trail herd was crossing the river a mile or more to the west. There's one we could steal right there, little Eddie said. That one's barely in the territory, Dan said. We'd have to follow it for a month, and I ain't in the mood. I said we head for Arkansas first, Roy said. We could rob a bank or two. Jake was not listening to the Polliver very closely. A party of nesters, four wagons of them, had stopped at the store buying supplies. They were farmers, and they had left Missouri and were planning to try out Texas. Most of the men folk were inside the store buying supplies, though some were repairing the wagon wheels or shoeing horses. Most of the women folk were starved-looking creatures in bonnets, but one of them was neither starved nor in a bonnet. She was a girl of 17 with long black hair. She sat on the seat of one of the wagons barefoot, waiting for her folks to finish shopping. To Jake, she looked like a beauty. It occurred to him that beauties were his real calling, if he had one, and he wondered what could have possessed him to start out with a rough bunch like the Suggs when there were beauties right there in Texas that he hadn't even met, including the one on the wagon seat. He watched her for a while, and since her folks hadn't reappeared, decided he might just stroll over and have a word with her. Already he felt a yearning for a woman's talk, and he'd only been gone from Dallas a little more than a day. He'd been lounging in the shade of the store, but he stood up and carefully dusted his pants. Are you fixing to go to church or what? Dan Suggs asked. No, but I fancy a word or two with that black-haired gal sitting there on the wagon, Jake said. I've never talked to a woman from Missouri. I figure I might like it. Why wouldn't they talk like any other gals, Roy wondered. I heard you was a ladies' man, Dan said, as if it were a condemnation of sort. You met me in a whorehouse. Why would you doubt it, Jake said, tired of the little man's biting tone. If I like that gal, maybe I'll elope with her. He said just to remind everyone that he was still his own man. The closer he got to the girl, the better he liked her looks. She had fine features, and her thin, worn-out dress concealed a swelling young bosom. She realized Jake was coming her way, which agitated her a little. She looked off, pretending not to notice him. At close range, she looked younger, perhaps only 15 or 16. Probably she had scarcely even had a bow, or if she had, they would have only been farm boys with no knowledge of the world. She had curling upper lip, which he liked. It indicated she had some spirit. If she had been a whore, he would have contracted with her for a week just on her strength of that lip and the curve of her bosom. But she was just a barefoot girl sitting on a wagon with dust on her bare feet. Hello, miss, he said when he walked up. Going far? The young girl met his eye, though he could see that she was agitated that he had spoke to her. My name's Jake Spoon, he said. What's yours? Lou, she said, not much more than whispering the information. He did like the way her upper lip curved. Anne was about to say more, but before he could get the words out, something slammed him in the back, and his face was in the dirt. He hit the ground so hard he busted his lip. He rolled over, wondering if somehow one of the mules had got in a kick. It wouldn't have been the first time he was surprised by a mule, but when he looked up and blinked the dust out of his eyes, he saw an angry old man with long, sandy beard standing over him, gripping a 10-gauge shotgun. It was the shotgun that had knocked him down. The old fool whacked him across the shoulder blades with it. The man must have been standing behind the wagon. Jake's head was ringing, and he couldn't see good, though he could tell the old man was gripping the shotgun like a club. He wasn't planning to shoot. Jake got to his knees and waited until he caught his wind. You get, the old man said. Don't be talking to my wife. Jake looked up in surprise. He had assumed the old man must be her father. Though certainly a brusque greeting, it was not much more than he would have expected from a father. Fathers had always been touchy when he attempted to talk to their daughters, but the girl on the wagon seat was already a wife. He looked at her again, surprised that such a fresh pullet would be married to a man who looked to be in his seventies, at least. The girl just sat there, pretty as ever, watching the scene without expression. That Jake had deemed to look at her again infuriated the farmer more, and he drew back the shotgun to deliver another blow. Hold on, mister, Jake said. One lick he might let pass, but not two. Besides, the 10-gauge was a heavy gun, and used as a club, it could break a shoulder, or do worse. When Jake spoke, the old man hesitated a second. He even glanced at the girl on the wagon seat, but at the sight of her, drew back his lips in a snarl and raised the shotgun again. 
Before he could strike the second blow, Jake shot him. It surprised him as much as it did the nester, for he was not aware of even having pulled his gun. The bullet caught the nester in the breast and knocked him back against the wagon. He dropped the shotgun, and as he was sliding to the ground, Jake shot again. The second shot as much a surprise to him as the first. It was as if his arm and his gun were acting on their own, but the second shot also hit the old nester in the breast. He slid to the ground, rolled partly under the wagon on top of his own shotgun. He never needed to hit me, Jake said to the girl. He expected her to scream, but she didn't. The shooting seemed not to have registered with her yet. Jake glanced at the nester and saw that he was stone dead, a big blood stain on his gray work shirt. A line of blood ran down the stock of his shotgun he lay across. Then nesters began to boil out of Doan's store. It seemed they were twenty or thirty of them. Jake felt discouraged by the sight, for it reminded him of how many people had boiled out of the saloons in Fort Smith when they discovered Benny Johnson lying dead in the mud. Now another man was lying dead, and it was just as much an accident. If the old nester had just announced himself politely as the girl's husband, Jake would have tipped his hat and walked off. But the old man had whacked him and offered to do it again. He had only shot to protect himself. This time, he was up against twenty or thirty nesters. They were grouped in front of the store as if puzzled by the situation. Jake put his gun back in its holster and looked at the girl once more. Tell him I had to do it, he said. That old man might have cracked my skull with that gun. Then he turned and walked back toward the Suggs brothers. He looked back once at the girl and she smiled at him, a smile that was to puzzle him whenever he thought about it. She had not even got down from the wagon to see if her husband was dead. Yet she gave him that smile, though by the time... The nesters were all around the wagon. The Suggs boys were already mounted. Little Eddie handed Jake his rein. I guess that's the end of that romance, Dan Suggs said. Darn, I just asked her name, Jake said. I never knowed she was married. The nesters were all grouped around the body. The girl still sat on the wagon seat. Let's cross the river, Dan Suggs said. It's that or hire you a lawyer, and I say why waste the money. That store don't sell lawyers anyway, Roy Suggs remarked. Jake mounted but he was reluctant to leave. It occurred to him that if he went back to the nesters, he might bluff his way out of it. After all, it had been self-defense. Even dirt farmers from Missouri could understand that. The nesters were looking their way, but none of them were offering to fight. If he turned and rode into the territory, he'd be carrying two killings against his name. In neither case had he meant to kill or even known the man he had killed. It was just more bad luck. Noticing a pretty girl on a wagon seat was where it started in this case. But the law wouldn't look at it like that, of course. If he rode across the river with a hard bunch like the Suggses, he would be an outlaw, whereas if he stayed, the nesters might try to hang him or at least try to jail him in Fort Worth or Dallas. If that happened, he'd soon be on trial for one accident or another. It was a poor set of choices, it seemed to him, but when the Suggs brothers rode off, he followed and in 15 minutes was across the Red River. Once he looked back and could still see the wagons grouped around the little store, he remembered the girl's last smile, yet he had killed a man before he'd even seen her smile. The nesters made no pursuit. Them pumpkin rollers, Dan Suggs said contemptuously. If they was to follow, we'd thin them out in a hurry. Jake fell into a gloom. It seemed he could do nothing right. He'd hardly asked for more life than a clean saloon to gamble in and a pretty whore to sleep with, and that and a little whiskey to drink. He had no desire to be shooting people. Even during his years in the Rangers, he seldom actually drew aim at anyone, although he cheerfully threw off shots in the direction of the enemy. He certainly didn't consider himself a killer. In battle, Call and Gus were capable of killing ten to his one. And yet now, Call and Gus were respectable cattlemen looked up to everywhere they went, and he was riding with a gang of hardened outlaws who didn't care who they killed. Somehow he'd slipped out of the respectable life. He had never been a churchgoer, but until recently he had no reason to fear the law. The Suggs brothers kept plenty of whiskey on hand, and Jake began to avail himself of it. He stayed half drunk most of the time as they rode north. Even though he had killed a man in plain sight of them, the Suggs didn't treat him with any new respect. Of course, they didn't offer one another much respect either. Dan and Roy both poured scorn on little Eddie if he slipped up in his chores and made a remark they disagreed with. The only man of the company who escaped their scorn was Frog Lip. They seldom spoke to him, and he seldom spoke, but everyone knew he was there. They rode through the territory without incident, frequently seeing cattle herds on the move, but always swinging around them. 
Dan Suggs had an old pair of spy glasses he had brought back from the war, and once in a while he'd stand up in his stirrups and look one of the cattle outfits over to see if they contained enemies of his or any cowboys he recognized. Jake watched the herds too, for he still had hope of escaping from the situation he was in. Rude as Call and Gus had treated him, they were still his compañeros. If he spotted the Hat Creek outfit, he had it in mind to sneak off and rejoin them. Even though he'd made another mistake, the boys wouldn't know about it, and the news might never reach Montana. He would even cowboy if he had to, be taking his chances with the Suggses. He was careful not to give his feelings away, though. He had never inquired about the herds, and if the subject of Colin McRae came up, he made it plain that he harbored a grudge against them, and he would not be sorry to see them come to grief. When they got into Kansas, they began to see the occasional settler, sod house nesters mostly, Jake hardly thought any of them could have enough money to be worth the trouble of robbing, but the younger Suggs' brothers were all for trying them. I thought we was going to regulate the settlers, Roy said one night. What are we waiting for? The nesters has got some besides a milk cow and a pile of buffalo chips, Dan Suggs said. I'm looking for a rich one. If one was rich, he wouldn't be living in a hole dug out of a hill up here in Kansas, Jake said. I slept in one of those soddies once. So much dirt leaked out onto the roof during the night I woke up during near buried. That don't mean some of them couldn't have some gold, Lily said. I'd like to practice regulating a little so I'd have the hang of it when we do strike the rich ones. All we aim to do is let you watch anyway, Dan said. It don't take no practice to watch. I've shot a nester, little Eddie reminded him. Shot two. If they don't pay up, I might make it three. The object is to scare them out of their money, not shoot them, Dan said. You shoot too many and pretty soon you got the law after you. We want to get rich, not get hung. Now, he's too young to know what he's talking about, Roy said. Well, well, I won't shoot them then. I'll just scare them, little Eddie said. No, that's Frog Lips' job, scaring them pumpkin eaters, Dan said. He'll scare them a sight worse than you will. The next day, Frog Lip got his chance. They saw a man plowing beside a team of big horses. A woman and a small boy were carrying buffalo chips in a wheelbarrow and piling them beside a low sod house that was dug into a slope. Two milk cows grazed nearby. He can afford them big horses, Roy pointed out. Maybe he's got money. Dan had been about to ride past and Jake hoped he would. He still hoped they'd hit Dodge before the Suggs boys did any regulating. He might get free of them and Dodge. Two accidents wouldn't necessarily brand him for life, but if he traveled much farther with a gun outfit like the Suggs's, he couldn't expect a peaceful old age, or any old age probably. But Dan decided on a whim to rob the farmer if he had anything worth being robbed of. They usually hide the money in the chimney, he said. Either that or they bury it in an orchard, though I don't see no orchard. Frog Lip kept an extra pistol in his saddlebags. As they approached the fanner, he got it out and stuck it in his belt. The fanner was plowing a shallow furrow through the tough prairie grass. Seeing the riders approach, he stopped. He was a middle-aged man with curly black beard, thoroughly sweated from his work. His wife and son watched the Suggs' approach. Their wheelbarrow was nearly full of buffalo chips. Well, I guess you can expect a fine crop along about July if damn Texas cattle don't come along and eat it all up, Dan said. The man nodded in a friendly way as if he agreed with the sentiment. We're here to see you reap what you sow, Dan went on. It'll cost you $40 gold, but we'll deal with the herds when they show up. Your crops won't be disturbed. No speaking English, the man said, still smiling and nodding in a friendly way. Oh, hell, damn German, Dan said. I figured this was a waste of time. Round up the woman in the sprout frog. Maybe this old Dutchman married an American gal. Frog lip loped over and drove the woman and the boy near the farmer. He rode so close to them that if he had fallen off his horse, he would have stepped on them. He'd taken the pistol out of his belt, but didn't need it. The woman and the boy were terrified, and the fanner too. He put his arms around his wife and child, and they all stood there crying. Look at them blubber, little Eddie said. I've never seen such cowards. Will you shut your damn mouth, Dan said. Why wouldn't they be scared? I would be in their place, but I'd like to get the woman hushed long enough to see if she can talk English. The woman either couldn't or wouldn't. She didn't utter a word in any language. She was tall and skinny and just stood there by her husband crying. It was plain all three of them expected to be killed. Dan repeated his request for money and only the boy looked as if he understood it. He stopped crying for a minute. 
That's it, Sonny. It's only cash we want, Dan said. Tell your pa to pay us and we'll help him guard his crops. Jake hardly expected a scared boy to believe that, but the boy did stop crying. He spoke to his father in an old tongue, and the man whose face ran with tears composed himself a little and jabbered at the boy. The boy turned and ran lickety-split for the sod house. Go with him see what you can find, boys, Dan said. Me and Jake can ride herd on the family, I guess. They don't look too violent. Ten minutes later, the boy came racing back, crying again, and Frog Lip and the two younger Suggs followed. They had an old leather wallet with them, which Roy Suggs threw to Dan, and it had two small gold pieces in it. Why, this ain't but four dollars, Dan said. Did you look good? Yeah, we tore up the chimney and opened up all the trunks, Roy said. The purse was under the pallet they sleep on. They don't have a darn thing worth taking besides that. Four dollars to see them through, Dan said. That won't help much. We might as well take it. He took the two gold pieces and tossed the worn leather purse back at the man's feet. Let's go, he said. Jake was glad to see it come to no worse than that, but as they were riding away, Frog Lip turned and loped over to the milk cows. What's he aimed to do, shoot the milk cows? Little Eddie asked, for Frog Lip had his pistol in his hand. I didn't ask him and he didn't say, Dan replied. Frog Lip rode up beside the cows and fired a couple of shots in the air. When the cows started to lumber and run, he skillfully turned them up the slope and chased them right onto the roof of the sod house. The sod on the roof had grass still on it, looked not unlike the prairie. The cows took a few steps onto the roof and then their forequarters disappeared as if they'd fallen in a hole. Then their hindquarters disappeared too. Frog Lip reined in his horse and watched as both cows fell through the roof on the sod house. A minute later, one came squeezing out the small door and the other followed. Both cows trotted back to where they had been grazing. <laughs> that frog, Dan Sugg said. I guess he just wanted to ventilate the house a little. All we got was four dollars, little Eddie said. Well, it was your idea, Dan said. You wanted the practice and you got it. He's mad because he didn't get to shoot nobody, Roy said. He thinks he's a shooter. Well, this is a gun outfit, ain't it, little Eddie said. We ain't cowboys, so what are we then? Travelers, Dan said. Right now we're traveling to Kansas looking for what we can find. Frog Lip rejoined them as silently as he had left. Despite himself, Jake could not conquer his fear of the man. Frog Lip had never said anything hostile to him or even looked his way on the whole trip, and yet Jake felt a sort of apprehension whenever he rode close to the man. In all his travels in the West, he had met few men who gave off such a strong sense of danger. Even Indians didn't, although, of course, there had been few occasions where he had ridden close to an Indian. Wonder if them Saudis get that roof fixed before the next rain, Dan Suggs said. If they had a little more cash, Frog might have left them alone. The frog didn't comment.